Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today, which means what? It means this. What did Jesus teach and say? What did the apostles teach and say? When you look at Christianity in the world today, it is going further and further and further away from God and Christ than ever before, trying to blend in and mix in other religious beliefs with the scriptures. And that creates a great hodgepodge of nothingness because God does not deal that way. The truth is, we have to come to God on His terms. We don't come to God on our terms and ask God to approve what we are doing. We go to God to find out what He tells us to do, and what to do, and how to do it, and why we should do it. And most people are completely ignorant of what the Bible actually says, because in the churches they go to, they find that they hear just the same old story over and over again. And that creates a whole new class of Christians. They still profess Christ, but they declare to the churches they want none of that whatever the churches are doing. So they are called by the pollster Barnaba, nuns. Do you find yourself in that predicament? Well, if you do, you need our booklet, Why Christianity is Failing in America, and not just in America, but every place in the world. And why is that happening? And why is it that Christianity in this world, in the churches that you see, they're trying to please people rather than trying to teach people how to please God? It's completely the opposite. Now then, let's understand something very important. No one is going to come to Christ or the Father on their terms and say, oh, look at me, look at the good work I'm doing. No, let's read a very, very important scripture and see what it exactly says in John 6, verse 44. No one, now think about that for a minute, no one. That means no man, no woman, no child. No one can come to me, can come to Christ. Now, a lot of people want to come to a Christian church in the world so they can be better people, so that they can meet friends, so they can find those of like-mindedness. But in that, they're not coming to Christ because something special, spiritual, has to happen. So let's read on. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me, draws him. Now think about that for a minute. So if a person goes to a church, and of course, all the churches, most of them are on Sunday, so you go, and you're welcome, and you find nice people there, and they really respect that you're coming, want you back again, and of course, the whole thrust of Christianity in the world is to get people in church. Well, that's not the plan of God. People who are true Christians, wherever they are, are part of the church of God. See, you can't go join it and sign up online so-and-so to be a member in a particular church which has a particular set of doctrines, and you agree with most of them. No, let me read it again here. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That means there must be a spiritual experience in your life 
where you come to the point that you know you need God. And so you cry out to God. And that is the first step. Now let's see what else that Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way. Now think about that phrase for a minute. I am the way. That is the way for you to walk in your life. That is the way of the instructions for you to follow Christ. You can't do it your way. Remember this. The problem of every human being in all churches and religions is this. They want to do their religion their way and invite God in. Well, that's not how it works. We saw you cannot come to Christ unless the Father draw you. Okay? Now it says here, I am the way. The way that a Christian should live. The way that a Christian should think. And that's according to the Word of God. And the truth. Now stop there and think for a minute. God is a God that's impossible for Him to lie. He cannot lie under any circumstances and will never accept any worship of him based upon the teachings and lies of men. These people have gone to Lourdes in the foothills of the Pyrenees in the hope that the Virgin Mary might cure them of cancer and heart disease. These people have gone to Medjugorje in Bosnia and Herzegovina to pray that they might get a chance to talk to dead beloved relatives. And these people are praying at the western wailing wall of the old Jewish temple in Jerusalem and leaving all sorts of notes for God to read in the cracks between the stones. No wonder some atheists just think the whole of religion is ludicrous and they aren't bothered about saying so very directly. Jesus said, I am the truth. Now, in the first part of the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? So we have the Father and the Son. The truth we find in John 17, 17, that your word, O God, is the truth. Now that means anything contrary to the word of God is not of God. One of the greatest deceptions and hoaxes that has ever been is for ministers to stand in the pulpit and say, the law has been done away. Because they stopped preaching the gospel of grace and went and preached a gospel that is no gospel at all, which is mixing grace with old covenant law. They mix it together in a confusing cocktail that cripples the body of Christ. You wish they'd just preach law because everyone would know, or just preach grace because everyone would know. The big danger is when you mix them together. Okay, have you got that? And people say, well, we're not preaching the Ten Commandments. Friends, anything that says, if you do this and you try harder and you measure up and you perform this, then God will give you the blessing, is law. Jesus Christ at the cross said it's finished. The whole inheritance is now yours. You don't have to do a thing. You just need to believe. So what else is there to do? Believe. Yeah, but what else? Believe. Yes. Believe in the goodness of God. Yeah, but, but, but what else? Believe. <laughs> but, 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 but what am I meant to do? Believe. Look at how it is in the world. Where there is no law, there is chaos. There's lawlessness. There's all of these things. Because they say that the Ten Commandments are harsh. God doesn't say that. He says, keep them because I will bless you. We'll see that in a little bit. Now, continuing. And the life. 
So this means Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that's eternal life. Now notice what he says again. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. So you have a joint operation here, don't you? The Father must draw you, and you must answer, because many are called and few are chosen. Now think on that for a minute. When you look at Christianity in the world, with the billions that are there, how can they be the few? They cannot. And do they keep the commandments of God? That's the key. Some who might not like to keep the commandments of God say, there you go again on the commandments. Well, we'll show you some things concerning that again. But think about it. If the law is done away, it's okay to murder, it's okay to kill, it is okay to commit adultery, and every sexual perversion, it's okay to steal, it's okay to lie. Huh. Doesn't that sound like the world today? Yes, because they are far, far, far from God. And this booklet that we have, Why Christianity is Failing, shows you exactly why it is happening, because they are abandoning God. Now, there's another book that's interesting reading, Christianity Without God by Lloyd Gearing. And that's what we have today. And that's why the world is in such a terrible condition, Christianity without God. While this might look like a regular church, the congregation of like-minded believers inside come with a rather fundamental missing ingredient. This is a church without God. What happens in Sunday Assembly, we start off with a couple of songs. We've got a great live band because we're in Nashville. We've got great musicians. Then we have someone give a little talk, a little uh, poem, or uh, we usually have a good speaker. We've had some scientists, philosophers, physicists, and that sort of thing. Nashville is often described as the buckle of the Bible Belt or the Protestant Vatican. But even here in this city of 700 churches, the Sunday Assembly has found its niche. I was raised in the church. My whole family was Roman Catholic and we were very faithful growing up in the 60s and 70s. Later, as an adult, I just could not continue in the Catholic Church because of its rejection of women, um, clergy, and women's leadership and also because of their dogma against gay and lesbian people. And I had just recently come out. A church without God, can it really catch on? Well, the organizers of the Sunday Assembly in Nashville certainly hope so. Now, what's the first thing you have to do when coming to God? If God is drawing you and you see the troubles in your life, you want God to help you? All right, let's come back here to Mark the first chapter. Let's see what Jesus said when he began to preach the gospel. Verse 14, now after the imprisonment of John, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is not the church. The Catholics say that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God in heaven, and that the kingdom of God is the Catholic Church on earth, of whom the Pope is the vicar or replacement of Christ. No one can replace Christ. Do you understand that? Christ, if you understand the Bible, is the head of his church. Verse 15, and saying, the time has been fulfilled, the fulfillment of the first coming of Christ. And everything that that means, and everything that that portrays. And the kingdom of God is near at hand. He was the king, is the king of the kingdom of God. So it's near at hand, meaning that Christ is here. But notice what he says. Repent 
and believe in the gospel. Now, that is the very first criteria in order for you to come to God. You must repent. You must recognize your problems and difficulties and that you cannot solve them. Now, we've got a short series on what is real repentance. That means you come to a point in your life that you know you need God and that your way isn't working. And you start praying to God. Now, God will hear and he will answer. And you must keep coming to God. You cannot just start and then stop when the pressure's off. Because true Christianity is forever. Now, how is God going to find someone who is searching for him, huh? Let's come here to John, the fourth chapter. We'll see something very interesting. And at this point, Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And she was explaining to Jesus the worship that they had in Samaria. So let's pick it up here in verse 19. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but you say that the place where it is obligatory to worship is Jerusalem, which at that time it was true. See, because back in the 500s BC, there was a break off from Jerusalem, and they set up a temple in Samaria just like the one in Jerusalem, and they used the first five books of Moses. That's how the Samaritan religion got started. And they brought in all other pagan religions and amalgamated them together. And they thought they were superior to the Jews. Well, the Jews had their problems, as we find in the Gospels. Now, notice Jesus' answer to her. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Now, this is kind of like trying to find a church today, right? You want to find a church where you can worship God. But you see, you need to ask the question, what do they do? Do they keep the commandments of God? What day do they worship on? What are the holidays that they keep? Because all of those are profoundly important to answer the question. Now, notice what he said about their worship. You do not know what you worship. Now, isn't that true with most of the Christians today, with everything coming in? How are you going to synthesize Islam, the Quran, and the Bible. Impossible. You can't do it. That's adding to the Word of God and taking away from the Word of God, which God says in the Old Testament, don't do it, and in the New Testament, don't do it. You know not what you worship. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, at least the true God was there in Jerusalem in spite of the sins of the people. Now, notice what he says. This answers the question, if you're desperate, if you're in trouble, if you need God's help, how is God going to find me? But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, that's important to understand. The Spirit of God and the truth of God, not in the way that you think 
is good, the way that God declares is good and true. For the Father is indeed, now notice this, seeking those who worship him in this manner. So if you're seeking God, you want to know where he is, you want to be in contact with him, we'll show you how that works in just a little bit. Very important, because God will hear and God will answer if you're really sincere and true, and repenting. The Father is indeed seeking those who worship him in this manner. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, not with rosaries, not with crosses, not with idols, statues, crucifixes. Those are all signs of the false worship. So let's answer the question, how is God going to find you? Well, we have to come clear to the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, a little sidebar on the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the book of Jesus Christ's revelation that the Father gave to him to give to John to give to us. So in this case, the apostle John was only the secretary writing what Christ told him to write. And it's such a way that you can't pick it up and understand all of it all at once if you're just getting acquainted with the Bible. You need to start with the simple things, and we'll explain what those are in just a bit. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace be to you from him who is, notice this is from Christ, and who was, and who is to come. Now notice this next phrase, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Now what are the seven spirits? Well, come over here to chapter 3 and verse 1. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, What are the seven spirits of God? They are before the throne of God. They are there. Let's come to Revelation 5 and verse 6. Now, this is part of the vision that Christ gave to John. He was actually able to see a silhouette of God the Father on his throne and the throne and Christ. Because Everything in prophecy and everything in the rest of the book of Revelation is not going to be done until it is time from the throne of God for it to occur. And if it's not time, it's not going to occur. Now, a little sidebar on that. That's why so many are wrong in prophecy. Because They don't look at the Word of God to find out what, when, where, and why, and who. Verse 6, Then I saw, and behold, before the throne and the four living creatures, before the elders standing a lamb, as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So the seven spirits of God go into all the earth seeking those who are truly seeking God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now, that's an amazing thing to understand. These are the eyes of God. So when it says in the Psalms, the eyes of God look upon men, it's the seven spirit that do that. Now, what they are and how they work, we don't know, but that's what their job is, and that's what they do. Now let's come to 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. So this tells us, how is God going to find me? I'm one of billion. Yes, 7.25 billion. Now why would God be interested in you if you're repentant? He wants to help you and draw you where we began with the first scripture. Now, you don't hear anything like this in the Sunday-keeping churches. They have you come in, 
And you say a little prayer if you stand up and acknowledge that Jesus is your Savior, and you say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins, and now you are saved for eternity. A hoax, a hoax, a hoax. Not true. We'll see that in a bit. Verse 9, 2 Chronicles 16. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in all the earth. All the time. Working all the time. You could say, kind of like low-level satellites with the ability to find those who are seeking God, then God begins to answer that prayer. And it's with these seven spirits that the Father draws the person to Christ. And then Christ draws you to the Father. And you come to God the Father and Jesus Christ in heaven above directly through prayer. But here's how it starts to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Now that means not lying. Not like the crook who gets caught and says, no, don't, don't, don't shoot, and he just killed ten people. He's no more repentant than a rattlesnake. See, this is how God draws. And this is why we have church at home. And church at home is the place to start, to learn the Word of God. Now, if you have some doubt about the Bible and so forth, then we have three books and a trilogy. How credible is the Bible? You've got to prove the Bible to be true, the Word of God. And there are no lies in it. And then the one, God or no God because atheism is the fastest growing religion in the world and market. And then finally, the most important book of all that you need is, Lord, what should I do? And that's right from Mark, the first chapter. Repent and believe the gospel. And that's the whole message of Christ three books and a trilogy. Those will help you know and understand how to find God. So once again, thank you for inviting me into your home. So this is Fred Calder saying, till next time, so long, everyone. <laughs>